Good evening, everyone. The death toll has risen in the latest attack by terrorists. They opened fire at airports in two European cities. Tonight, 17 are dead, more than 100 injured. The governors of Minnesota and three other states got together in St. Paul to decide what to do about the farm crisis. And it looks like the strike against Austin's Hormel Meat Company will go on. The 10 p.m. report is coming up next. You are watching WCCO Television, Minneapolis, St. Paul. This is the 10 p.m. report. And it, but it kept going, pop, 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 and, and, and you thought, shoot him, shoot him, kill him. The words of a man who today came face to face with terror and lived. Others weren't so lucky. They died as Arab terrorists opened fire at airports in two European cities. Good evening, everyone. As 1985 draws to a close, terrorists have struck once again. Their targets were passengers waiting to check in for flights on the Israeli airline El Al. The attacks were apparently coordinated to occur at the same time at airports in Rome and Vienna. Seventeen people, including three Americans, died in the two attacks. A hundred and seventeen others were injured. Witnesses say the terrorists first rolled hand grenades towards the passengers, then opened up with machine guns. Police killed three of the terrorists in Rome and wounded two others. Witnesses say one security officer shot one terrorist in the head at close range to keep him from firing a sub machine gun. And grenades were rolled into the hall um, to, to aim at, at the people standing at the counter of Elal. And then we realized that people were rushing off, off the corridor and tried to hide uh, by the side somewhere. And that's what we did. In Vienna, two attackers hijacked a car but were cornered by police a few miles from the airport. One was killed in the ensuing firefight. A Madison, Wisconsin man is believed to be among the Americans who died in the attacks. He was 29-year-old Frederick Gage. He was a member of the board of Madison Newspapers Incorporated. Other victims were 11-year-old Natasha Simpson, whose father is an Associated Press Editor in Rome, and 20-year-old John Bonacor of Bloomington, Delaware. And we've just received word that another American has died of wounds suffered in the attack. He's identified as 31-year-old Don Meeland. His hometown is not yet known. Who was responsible for today's attack? It's not yet clear, but a man claiming to represent a splinter group of the PLO took responsibility today. And a note found on the body of one attacker said, quoting now, To Zionists, we will violate your people, your heritage, your tradition. The war has begun. Signed, the Martyrs of Palestine. And as the Western world condemned the attacks, Israel vowed to get even. Officials said they'll find out who's to blame and promise to fight terrorism in every way. Israel will reserve to itself the ways, the means, and the time how to cope with this problem. And President Reagan joined in the condemnation today, calling the terrorists, quoting now, criminal and cowardly. Today's attacks add one more blot to what is already one of terrorism's bloodiest years. On June 14, TWA Flight 847 was hijacked by Lebanese Shiites who murdered an American serviceman. September 25th in Larnaca, Cyprus, Palestinians loyal to Yasser Arafat killed three Israelis on a yacht. On October 7th, PLO gunmen seized the Achille Laurel cruise ship and murdered Leon Klinghoff for a 69-year-old Jewish American. And on November 23rd, Arab gunmen hijack an Egyptian jet to Malta. Egyptian commandos storm the plane and 60 die. One bit of good news, the State Department says U.S. intelligence agents have been able to thwart 90 planned terrorist attacks this year. There is other news tonight. Minnesota and three of its neighbors join in a fight for a better national farm policy. The governors of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and North and South Dakota met in St. Paul today and agreed the just signed farm bill is worse than no bill at all. They may file a lawsuit against the federal government in a move they claim is not just politics as usual. Pat Kessler has our report. What was billed as a simple farm conference took... It's not as remarkable the governors met today as it is they are speaking with one voice. Their hope is that state legislatures will follow, creating a kind of Midwestern farm policy. Pat Kessler, WCCO Television News. Some Midwest states then are uniting to paint the federal government as the villain of the farm economy, but not all farmers and farm activists buy that, as Marsha Fleur reports. 
Early this year, farmers gathered on the steps of the Minnesota State Capitol, demanding that politicians save them. The governors agreed before they spoke publicly today not to raise any false hopes, but to some of the farmer activists who heard them, they raised no hopes at all. This is Marcia Fleur, WCCO Television News, the State Capitol. And tomorrow, groundswell leaders will meet with Governor Rudy Perpich. Members of the activist farm group occupied the Mankato Production Credit Association office nearly two weeks ago, demanding an audience with the governor. A spokeswoman for Perpich says 14 groundswell members and Mr. Perpich will meet in his office at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning to discuss the plight of Minnesota's farmers. And earlier today, one groundswell leader, Bobby Polzine, began handing over her farm equipment to creditors. Polzine and her husband voluntarily brought several pieces of machinery to a local fairground, that in accordance with an agreement reached with the Farmers Home Administration. Her creditors agreed not to sell any of that equipment before March 1st. The Polzines are seeking FMHA approval on a previously rejected loan application. Today's equipment delivery is part of the Polzines' effort to show the Farmers Home Administration they are cooperating with creditors. And still ahead on the 10 p.m. report, will striking workers at the Austin Hormel plant go back to work? The votes were counted tonight and we'll get the results next. And we'll tell you why some police officers in Miami are under arrest tonight. Please stay with us. The Hormel Meat Packers strike is in its fifth month and apparently will continue. Almost 1,500 members of local P9 finished voting tonight in Austin to decide if they're going to accept what Hormel says is its final contract offer. Terry Sater of our staff has a live phone report now from Austin. He has the final results of local P9's vote, which international union representatives had opposed. Terry? Mike, the contract proposal... Three of the smugglers drowned. Today's arrests are the latest in a sweeping series designed to check the spread of drug-related corruption on Miami's police force. Tonight, five defendants in a drug case, including Indian movement leader Clyde Bellacourt, are free after posting bail ranging up to $100,000. Earlier today in federal court, special agents testified they videotaped the defendants selling LSD on three occasions. The five men were arrested Tuesday for allegedly conspiring to sell the hallucinogen. Officials say they bought more than $100,000 worth of LSD during their year-long investigation. The Bellacourt supporters say the charges are politically motivated. Tonight, 33 Minnesotans participating in a Central American peace walk are resting near the Nicaraguan-Honduras border. But Honduran officials say they might not let the marchers into their country. The peace walkers are expected to embark on a 12-mile journey through Contra-controlled Nicaraguan territory tomorrow, winding up in Honduras by nightfall. As at past border crossings on the walk, a large number of well-wishers are expected to greet the protesters tomorrow. We are in the season when most of us take time to reflect and to pray for, among other things, peace on earth. And in Apple Valley today, Minnesota Zoo officials were yelling, all aboard, once again. Officials announced plans to save one of the zoo's endangered species, the monorail. The zoo says it's collected enough money to keep the monorail running. Investors derailed the motorized ride on October 1st when they couldn't make their loan payments. But now zoo board members plan on signing a $1.5 million purchase agreement. That'll be on Monday. And they hope to get the monorail back on its tracks by this coming spring. And that seems an awful long ways away at this well, point. Why don't you feed a monorail? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we're not exactly calling it a heat wave, but we do have some warmer temperatures in the next couple of days. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Vacationers and local residents hoping, hoping to enjoy the tropical weather in the southern U.S. over the Christmas holidays were simply out of luck today. Temperatures dropped to record lows in six southern cities, including Miami, Tampa, and Fort Myers. Unaccustomed and unprepared for chilly weather, many people wrapped themselves in whatever they could find to keep warm, and a suntan oil salesman said the colder-than-usual temps we're ruining his business. Hmm. <laughs> well, you find it hard to feel sorry for the suntanners, <laughs> yeah, but the farmers are having yeah. a hard time down Especially there. Especially the overnight temperatures dropping below freezing. They were up to 50 degrees today. Uh, that makes our prospect of 10s and 20s for the weekend seem <laughs> rather dim. It? it sure does. <laughs> well, anyway, we take what we can get up here, and I guess they get what they get down there, too, from time to time. Now, the extended forecast uh, then kind of takes us back uh, down or holds us steady. Temperatures in the single digits to the mid-teens and overnight lows right around 0 to 10 above. But no major snowstorms in sight, just some partly cloudy skies. So.
things could be worse. Okay, thanks, Mike. <laughs> well, still ahead on the 10 p.m. report, a look back at the medical developments which made news this past year. And how these medical issues and breakthroughs helped and affected Minnesotans in 1985. Tonight, word of yet another medical advance designed to help ailing heart patients. And if this one lives up to expectations, it could make heart transplants obsolete. Officials at Pittsburgh's Allegheny General Hospital say one of their doctors has developed a new surgical heart procedure. It involves wrapping a muscle from the patient's back around the damaged heart and teaching the muscle to beat. Further details of Dr. George McGovern's experimental procedure will be announced next week. Meanwhile, in Minneapolis tonight, doctors at Abbott Northwestern Hospital say Jarvik 7 artificial heart recipient Mary Lund has developed a fever. The hospital's daily medical report emphasizes, however, that there are no signs of infection. The 40-year-old Kensington woman became the world's first female artificial heart recipient more than a week ago, and doctors say her chances of survival still remain at less than 50-50. Mary Lund remains alive tonight thanks to one of the many medical and technological breakthroughs used by doctors across the country this past year. But the continuing spread of AIDS potentially affected all of us, and it captured the entire world's attention. Our health and science reporter Tony Vigneri has a year-end report on the issues, developments, and people at the medical forefront in Minnesota during the past 12 months. It was AIDS that dominated the medical headlines in 1985. And it seems certain that in 1986, there will be a call to solve the Twin Cities empty hospital bed problem by closing or consolidating several hospitals. Tony Vigneri, WCCO Television News, the Twin Cities. And we're holding down the fort, and Tom Hanneman is enjoying a, a hockey game, right, Tom? Quite a hockey game indeed, Mike. Who's number one in the state of Minnesota in high school hockey? Well, we're one period away from finding out in a game so far that has been an upset. Sports is next. Wildcard matchup. The 49ers also a three point pick over the Giants. That's it right now in the third period. It remains Edina 2 0 over Hill Murray. Back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. And finally, we'll wrap up this holiday week with one more Christmas story. It begins in 1971 when James McDonald of Larchmont, New York, injured his head in a couple of auto accidents. In March of that year, suffering from a headache, McDonald decided to take a walk. He never returned. McDonald developed amnesia and somehow wound up in Philadelphia. He could remember his first name, but could not recall his wife or his home in Larchmont. McDonald got a job as a short order cook in Philly and kept it for 14 years, until three days ago, when on Christmas Eve, James McDonald fell and bumped his head, and it all came back. McDonald showed up back in Larchmont on Christmas Day, and his wife Ann calls it a miracle unbelievable story. It sure <laughs> is, I should say, a miracle. Can you imagine her reaction? And After 14 years, 14 years, and I understand they, they now have to prove that he's not been legally dead all this time. Oh my gosh. On top of it all. That is incredible. Well, we are in for a pleasant weekend this weekend. Forecast calls for partly sunny skies with a high of 12 degrees. Good night, everyone. Good night. The 10 p.m. Report with Pat Miles and Don Shelby. Mike Fairborn's weather and Mark Rosen Sports has been a presentation of WCCO Television, serving the people of the Twin Cities for four decades.